In our top story tonight, the Zimbabwean president, Emerson Munangagwa, has thanked President Jacob Zuma for allowing him to spend his 16 days of exile in South Africa. Munangagwa is on his first working visit to South Africa since his inauguration on the 24th of November. and Seven's reporter, Tlingiwa Mutang, has the story. The new Zimbabwe president is on a charm offensive. Emerson Mnangagwa's visit to South Africa comes barely a month since he took office. But Nangangwa has his work cut out for him. The country, once known as a breadbasket of Africa, had long since become a basket case. From now on, Zimbabwe is open for business. Yes, there will be political issues, but primarily it's economics, economics, economics and trade for Zimbabwe. To achieve that, we need to revisit our own legislation in Zimbabwe to open up business. President Jacob Zuma has pledged to strengthen ties between the countries. I'm very happy that uh, <laughs> uh, Comrade President did come because I'm, I'm more clearer now about the situation uh, <clears throat> in Zimbabwe. It confirmed what I could observe from a distance that uh, it looks like there's stability now uh, in, in Zimbabwe. And of course I also commented the, the, <clears throat> the manner in which uh, the, the, the army, when it had, it had a concern, how it handled the situation, uh, we could not, the situation could not go out of hand. Zimbabwean businessmen in South Africa are upbeat about new investment opportunities. Some say they're even willing to relocate back home. This is magnificent. It's a turning point in the history of the country and we are so happy to be part of the occasion. Indeed, we are going to make Zimbabwe great again. We welcome the new administration of President Emerson Nangagba, because I believe in him, is a man of no nonsense. Is a no nonsense man. Is a is a man who, who knows the boss and nuts of business. So we respect all what he said there, and uh, you could see that all what he said there is genuine. And we am also encouraging all businessmen, all international investors, to come and invest in Zimbabwe. The arrival of protesters at the Zimbabwean embassy evidently did little to dampen the mood. With the new administrations, Zimbabweans are set to flourish the economy by introducing new investment opportunities that will rebuild the country. Shengiba Mutawu, ANN7, Pretoria. Now joining us live via Skype is Africa analyst, Mr. Edward Mitole. Very good evening to you, Mr. Mitole. Thank you for joining us. So we saw the Zimbabwean president has been in office for less than a month now. He says he's on a road path to have the economic turnaround be implemented as soon as possible. He gave a State of the Nation address just a couple of days ago, which was well received by the opposition and, of course, members of ZANU-PF and others within the region. What do you think should be top of his agenda to get this realized? Good evening, our viewers. Um, I'm worried about the narrative that the new president of Zimbabwe with his team of advisors are trying to propagate to the world. Uh, Mr. Nangagwa is coming in at a time when Zimbabwe has been experiencing hardship, but only a month after taking over, the steering wheel, Nangagwa is on a public relations mission to try to win investor confidence and try to appeal to the, to the diasporians to come back to Zimbabwe and invest in the country. What is worrying about this narrative is that there have been all these years of struggle, all these years of suffering, all these years of hardship. There are Zimbabweans in the country who have persisted, who have held the country together. 
they are hardworking Zimbabweans who are still living in Zimbabwe today, who have been suffering under sanctions, but they have managed to feed the population of Zimbabwe through their hard work. These are the people who are missing in all these public relations campaign. There hasn't been any mention so far in all the visits that the president has made to Lusaka, to South Africa, I haven't heard him mention or acknowledge the contributions that citizens in Zimbabwe have made over the 10 year period of drought. So it is worrying to me because I feel change in narrative uh, immediately after President Mugabe has been uh, overthrown, we have a new narrative that seems to suggest that only white people or diasporians can save Zimbabwe. Remember that farmers resident in Zimbabwe right now have been feeding the population of Zimbabwe without loans from banks, without huge investments from the Zimbabwean fiscals. These people have been working within their limited means to feed the population of Zimbabwe. And now we have the president coming to South Africa to appeal to the diasporians who left Zimbabwe to come back to Zimbabwe and invest in the country. In this, in this equation, we can already see the role of, that banks are going to play because now the president is telling the world that for these new investments, there is a component called command farming where the, the country is going to invest in the farmers that are coming back to Zimbabwe. So it's like the banks will be involved in financing new investors to feed the population. You, you understand that the moment you start trying to invite the banks to come to your country, already you are saying to your population that here we are surrendering to this new form of slavery. The banks... I'm sorry, no doubt that Zimbabweans have been very resilient in uh, trying to feed their families in an almost um, non-existent economy. It, it has been a very tough period over the past decade. But going forward, do you believe there are any legacy projects that were left by the former President Robert Mugabe that Munangagwa can build on going forward? Exactly. Um, we must avoid a situation where we are going to throw the, 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 the baby with the bath water. That's a very delicate balance that Nangagwa needs to tread. Because we have a country that is desperate to come out of a huge recession. We have a country that is desperate to attract investors. Remember that Zimbabwe is not is not is not crying out for resources. Zimbabwe has got resources. What it needs is massive injections of capital. It needs to trade a very delicate balance. It must not throw away Zimbabwe's foreign policy. Because the moment they throw away that foreign policy which says Zimbabweans can. Zimbabweans are able to work and build an as president. Now we have a narrative that seems to suggest that for Zimbabwe to come out of the present conundrum, it has to bring white people, it has to give back land to white farmers, it is open for business. That is a good thing. Opening for business shouldn't mean that they have to surrender their sovereignty. They have to keep their people in bondage once again. Remember, the, the banks will, they will be coming back to Zimbabwe for profit. 
The banks are, are, do not care whether the, the people starve or not. There's, the banks are not coming back to Zimbabwe to feed the people. The banks I, get, I get your point there, Mr. Matole. You spoke of mineral wealth, you spoke of farmers, but just going back to the issue of um, mineral wealth of Zimbabwe, it has been a strong economic factor, but we see a lot of states in Africa, not just in Zimbabwe, not really benefiting from this. What do you need, think needs to happen going forward? We, we have seen how Botswana seems to have handled it very well. Their mineral wealth seems to be benefiting the country. The policies that have been implemented in Zimbabwe have been very draconian to, you know, to investors that try to come and opening, open their companies. Companies, um, and also, you know, formulate employment. How do you balance the equation to make sure that the investors come, but Zimbabwe doesn't lose out at the same time? There is need for the state to play a very critical role. The state has to drive the whole transformation process. It must not surrender it to the whims of white monopoly capital. There must be a win-win situation where the, the government has to set the terms of the rules of the game, where it has to make sure that any investment that comes into Zimbabwe, there has to be massive benefits for the people of the country. In this way, there has to be reformulations and re-strategizing in terms of uh, international trade, inter-Africa trade, and global trade. Because what is going to happen now is a situation where, all, because of the, the, the creation of investor confidence, all the macroeconomic policies that are going to be, uh, to be drafted, investors are going to come to Zimbabwe. But in a situation where the country is desperate for investors, there is there are chances that we might surrender the country to the vultures. So what I'm saying is, let us make sure that the state has to drive the economy. There are so many models that Zimbabwe can learn from, where as a command economy, we do not lose our sovereignty to people who come to impoverish the people faith. Dubai is one example. You remember that Dubai is a capitalist economy, but yet the government has been able to put its foot down and make sure that the benefits that are accrued to the trade that is generated in Dubai benefits the people of Dubai. That is a model that Zimbabwe needs to borrow from. Mitholib, uh, for uh, the removal of sanctions against Zimbabwe um, that were brought about because of human rights abuses, because of uh, lack of media freedom, how important is the elections coming in 2018 for Zimbabwe, for the international observers to see that, um, you know, the human rights are being observed and there's a credible free and fair election? How important is that going forward to make sure that Zimbabwe is not a pariah state anymore going forward? Lifted. Remember, I've always said that I have problems with the narrative that seems to suggest that the sanctions were imposed on Zimbabwe, on Zimbabwe because human rights abuses. That's, that, that narrative is nonsensical. The sanctions were not imposed on Zimbabwe because of human rights abuses. There are other countries in Africa that have got far worse human rights abuses, but they are not, they are not under sanctions. Uganda is one of them. Rwanda is one of them. We are saying the sanctions have to be lifted. There are opposition parties like MDC. We have seen recently MDC going to the US, trying to plead with the US government not to lift the sanctions. That is nonsensical. Where, where, where are the facts? Because, I mean, MTC is one of those parties that, desper that is desperate to, to, to take over power. So they have, they have a grind to, to they have an axe to grind against the ZANU PF party. That is not that is not going to attract them the voters that they need for them to topple the ZANU PF from power. What MTC, what MTC should be doing to attract voters is by appealing to the international community to soften up to the new regime, to the new government that is that has just come in, and make sure that the sanctions are lifted for the benefit of the people.
Remember that the sanctions do not hurt the ruling elites. The sanctions hurt the poor man and woman on the street, in the villages. These people are the people who are waste heat by sanctions. So I have problems with the narrative that seems to suggest that if you impose sanctions on a country, then you are going to punish the ruling class, the ruling elite. That is nonsensical. I'm saying the sanctions should be lifted. There must be... Mr. Mtole, can you hear me? Uh, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there with Mr. Edward Mitole. Thank you so much for your time and your perspective and your analysis. We certainly appreciate it. I really enjoyed picking your brain. We'll have to leave it there. Africa analyst Mr. Edward Mitole joining us on Africa Tonight with regards to Zimbabwe. President Robert uh, Munanga, Emerson Munangagwa having come to South Africa on his first state visit saying Zimbabwe is open for business.